With Chapter 11, we start figuring out how to begin an investment plan. We've covered how to get your finances under control so you'll have extra money to invest. So how to get started. Here are the learning goals for Chapter 11. Number one, explain why you should establish an investment program. Number two, describe how safety, risk, income, growth, and liquidity affect your investment program. Number three, identify the factors that reduce investment risk. Basically, why and how to start your investment plan considering safety, risk, growth, and liquidity. Number four, understand why investors purchase government bonds. Number five, recognize why they purchase corporate bonds. Number six, evaluate bonds when making an investment. The rest of this chapter is devoted to various types of bonds. In Chapter 12, we'll look at stock. Chapter 13 is devoted to mutual funds. By this point, you should have established some clearly defined financial goals. A new car, a new home, college for your children, a retirement home. Whichever approach you take, dollar amounts or things or events desired, you need to be specific. Remember, goal setting has to be smart. Specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, time-based. This is true of investment goals as well. This slide recaps some basic questions to consider when contemplating investment goals. How much money do you need? How much risk are you willing to assume? This is critical. What conditions, economic or personal, could affect your goals? Marriage, children, loss of employment? Are your goals reasonably realistic? The R in SMART. Are you willing to give up spending now to meet your goals? Before you even start thinking about an investment plan, you need to be in good financial condition. Pay your bills on time. This is number one. Balance your budget. If you're spending more than you bring in, there's nothing left to invest. Make sure your credit card usage is under control. Your goal, remember, is to be a convenience user, paying off your credit card every month and avoid the cash advance option. It's costly. If you're in trouble, get help before you're in too deep to get out. You should have an emergency fund. The basic benchmark is three months of living expenses. If the economy is bad, more may be wise. Be sure you have access to funds for an emergency. This would be a valid reason to use the cash advance on your credit card. This is Exhibit 11-1 on page 351 in your text. Five steps to finding the money to invest. Number one, pay your bills, then pay yourself. Number two, take advantage of employer-sponsored retirement programs like their 401k. Number three, have money automatically saved for you, deducted from your check or transferred from your bank account. Number four, once or twice a year, make a special savings effort. If you get a bonus, play with some of it, but invest the majority. It's found money. Same with gifts, inheritances, etc., save and invest most of it. In the appendix to chapter one, we looked at the time value of money, so you should already be aware that over time, even a small amount will grow if left to compound. The key is to start early, leave your money to grow, and add to it. The caveat, higher return is virtually always coupled with higher risk. It's up to you to decide how much risk you can tolerate. Risk. That's the big issue with investing. We all want our money to grow, but safely. Risk, by definition, is uncertainty about what the outcome will be. Investing in just about everything other than government securities involves risk. It's up to you to determine how much risk you can tolerate and still sleep at night. Higher risk can generate higher returns. Can, not will. So what factors affect risk? Inflation. It's always there to some extent, the higher the inflation rate, the faster your dollars lose purchasing power. Interest rate risk relates to bonds whose value depends on the current market rate. Market rates and bond values move inversely, opposite to each other. Business failure risk relates to both bonds and stocks. The company issuing the securities could fail. As an investor, you'd be left with very little or nothing. Market risk is just the risk of being in the markets as opposed to investing in a risk-free asset such as government securities. The whole point of investing is to make your money grow. Common stock has by far the greatest growth potential, but also has the greatest risk. Growth in value means price appreciation. As a shareholder, you want the share price to go up. The other issue to consider in investing is liquidity. Now, liquidity has two dimensions the ability to convert an asset into cash quickly without significant loss of value. 
That second dimension is important. We can sell anything quickly if we're willing to take any price. As an individual investor, liquidity is important so that you have sufficient funds available in an emergency. Continuing with liquidity. On a continuum, assets can range from cash, near cash, to frozen assets. Your savings account is very liquid. Your home is not. Both are valuable assets, but only one can quickly be converted to cash. Checking and savings accounts are the most liquid investment venues. CDs come next, but usually have early withdrawal penalties. When we think of developing an investment plan, we immediately think of picking stocks. And picking stocks is a fascinating activity, but it's not the first step in designing your investment program. Asset allocation should be the first step in planning your program. The idea of an asset allocation is a high-level look at how your investment dollars should be allocated between various broad categories – stocks, bonds, the risk-free asset, real estate, foreign stocks. Exhibit 11.4 on page 357 in your text outlines the main factors in evaluating various commonly used categories of investments for safety, risk, income, growth, and liquidity. As an example, let's look at corporate stock. It rates average for safety, risk, income, and liquidity, but high for growth. This refers to the category of stock in general, not specific stocks. The idea with asset allocation is to determine what percentage of your portfolio should be invested in each of the broad categories from the previous slide. This slide lists items you should consider in determining your asset allocation. Your age. Some common guidelines say you should invest 100 or 110 minus your age as a percentage in stocks. The logic is that when you're younger, you can afford the risk of common stocks. If the market turns down, your portfolio has time to recover. As you get older, less time for your money to recover, so a lower percentage in stocks. What are your objectives? How much can you invest now? How much can you add each year? What's the economic outlook for the economy? What is your tolerance for risk? There are online quizzes to help you determine your risk tolerance level. Your investment horizon means when will you need the money? In five years for a new house or in 15 years for college? Bankrate has an online calculator to help you figure this out. Exhibit 11.5 on page 358 in your text. Titles, Typical Investments for Financial Security, Safety, Income, Growth, and Speculation. The idea is that you should take care of each level before moving up to the next level of risk with speculation at the very top. So what do you do? It's your job to evaluate potential investments. Just making an investment decision is not a one-time thing. You have to monitor your investments in order to make adjustments when necessary. And, of course, keep good records. If this seems daunting, seek the help of a professional. Certified financial planners are trained specifically to help individuals with all types of investments and tax planning. They are required to work for several years before using the CFP designation, and they take continuing education to stay current. So what do you do if the economy takes a hit? This is when having a sizable emergency fund can be important. If you've been working to keep your debts under control and staying within your budget, you're in good shape to weather the downturn. If your income is reduced as well, obviously reduce your spending. If you're unable to make credit payments, contact your lender immediately to work out a payment plan. You should already be monitoring the value of your investment accounts. Consider converting to cash, selling, if the values are dropping too rapidly and you don't foresee a rebound. We've looked at designing an overall investment plan. Let's move on to looking at one of the main types of investment assets, bonds. We start with bonds rather than stock, as bonds are a bit less complicated and they're more conservative. First, the basics, starting with government bonds. A bond is a pledge by the issuer to make periodic interest payments and to repay the face value at maturity. Basically, it's an interest-only loan with a specific life or maturity. Bonds are also called fixed income securities, since the payments are typically fixed. The most conservative and the lowest risk are government bonds. Federal, state, and local governments all issue bonds to finance the costs of government. The lowest risk are issued by the federal government, since they won't default on the loan. The federal government issues four types of fixed income securities that we'll cover. The shortest terms are Treasury bills or T-bills. Minimum investment is $100, but it's usually larger. T-bills are sold at a discount with maturity of 4, 13, 26, and 52 weeks. 
T-bills, like all government securities, are sold through a process called a Dutch auction. The return on a T-bill is subject to federal, but not state tax. Medium-term government securities are called treasury notes. They're also sold in $100 units. Interest is paid every six months. The rate is higher than that on T-bills, but they are again subject to federal, but no state tax. Treasury bonds are the government's source of long-term funding. They're issued in minimum units of $100. The so-called long bond is the 30-year T-bond. The interest rate is higher than on T-bills or Treasury notes. Interest, again, is paid every six months. TIPS, or Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, are a relatively new offering from the Fed beginning in 1997. They are sold in minimums of $100. TIPS are offered with 5, 10, and 30-year maturities. Interest is paid twice a year. Inflation is reflected by the principal changing with inflation. So quotes for outstanding tips show both the interest rate and the current principal. Exhibit 11.6 on page 363 recaps the description of the four federal government securities we just covered. Note that any of these can be purchased by individuals directly online through Treasury Direct or through a broker. Tips offer the most conservative, virtually risk-free investment available to individuals. Bonds issued by state and local governments are called municipal bonds. They can be issued by states, cities, counties, school districts, or special taxing districts with the funds going to finance ongoing expenses or special projects. The main feature of municipal bonds is the interest may be exempt from federal tax and also from the state tax in the state issued. Very attractive to high tax bracket investors. The tax exempt status may be affected by the use intended for the funds. Municipal bonds are frequently insured, which reduces the risk to the investor. Municipal bonds are usually one of two types. General obligation bonds are backed, as the slide says, by the full faith, credit, and taxing authority of the issuer. These are typically used to fund operating expenses. Revenue bonds are backed by the revenue generated by the project the funding is used for. For example, a toll bridge. When comparing a tax-free municipal bond to a taxable corporate bond, we have to find an equivalency. This slide demonstrates converting the yield on a tax-exempt bond to an equivalent taxable yield for comparison with a corporate bond. Note that the conversion depends on the marginal tax rate of the investor. As you can see in the example, given a tax-exempt bond paying 5%, for an investor in a 28% tax bracket, the tax-equivalent yield on the muni is the municipal yield divided by 1 minus the tax rate. 5% tax-free is equivalent to 6.94% taxable. Corporate bonds are similar in many ways to the government bonds we've just covered. A corporate bond is a pledge by the issuer to repay the face value at maturity while making interest payments every six months. They are again an interest-only loan. Because bonds are contractual, they are considered safer than stock or other riskier investments. And as mentioned, bonds overall are considered fixed income securities. When we talk about a corporation's debt financing, we are referring to their outstanding bonds. For corporate bonds, the face value is typically $1,000. This is the amount that will be repaid at maturity. The maturity date is the date when the face value will be repaid. Corporate bonds can theoretically have any maturity, but tend to be 15 to 30 years. Every bond issue has a bond indenture that serves as the contract between the issuer and the bond buyers and details everything about the issue. A financially independent firm acts as trustee and ensures that the terms of the bond indenture are enforced. Why do corporations sell bonds? They do it to raise funds to finance the expenses of the company. Bonds are contractual and have to be repaid, but bondholders are paid interest only, which is tax deductible to the issuer and bondholders have no vote, which stockholders do. In the event a firm fails and files for bankruptcy, bondholders do have a claim on the assets of the firm. There are a wide variety of types of bonds that firms can issue. The simplest is a debenture, which is simply unsecured debt. A mortgage-backed or secured bond is backed by physical collateral that in the event of bankruptcy will be sold to pay off the bondholders. Since secured debt is less risky, the bonds carry a lower interest rate. Convertible bonds offer the opportunity for bondholders to share in the growth of a firm. Remember, bondholders have loaned the company money. All they'll get is interest and the face value back at maturity. If the firm turns out to be the latest Google, 
bondholders do not share in that windfall. With a convertible bond, bondholders have the option to convert a bond to a pre-specified number of shares of common stock in the firm. Since this is a very attractive feature, convertibles carry lower interest rates than straight bonds. High yield or junk bonds have a significantly higher risk of default and carry a higher interest rate. Originally, all corporate bonds were high grade and only if a company fell on hard times would it fall into the junk bond category and be termed fallen angels. Along came the 1980s, Michael Milken, and the advent of original issued junk bonds used to finance many corporate takeovers. This also opened up the corporate bond market to firms willing to pay the higher interest rate who could not participate before. A call feature on a bond allows the issuer to recall the entire issue. Think of it like the option you have to refinance your mortgage if market rates dropped. The same is true for a corporation. Suppose the firm is paying 8% for 25 years and current rates are 5%. They could issue new debt at 5% and use the funds to call back the 8% bonds. Years ago, most bonds were not callable since market rates were fairly stable over time. Nowadays, market rates are very volatile, so most corporate bonds include a call feature. Bonds are usually call protected for the first five to ten years. I mean, why would you buy a 20-year bond with a great rate if it could be called back in a year? When a firm calls in a bond issue, a premium is paid. Frequently, that premium is equal to one coupon payment. If a company is faced with paying a higher interest rate than they would like due to a low credit rating, they may offer a sinking fund as part of the bond issue. With a sinking fund, the issuer makes payments to a trustee each year to retire a portion of the bond issue. The trustee can use the funds to call bonds by serial number or buy bonds in the market, whichever is cheaper. With a sinking fund call, there is no call premium. The positive is that the risk of default is reduced, but the downside is that the life of the bond is reduced as well. You bought a 20-year bond, and it might get called in year five. Most bonds are issued as one set all maturing on the same date. Serial bonds are issued in tranches, maturing on sequential dates. Say 10% of the issue matures each year for 10 years. The so-called fixed income is the interest income earned and paid every six months. All bonds in the United States are registered. The IRS wants to know who's getting the interest. Registered bonds are registered for both principal and interest payments. Registered coupon bonds are registered for the principal payment only. The coupon payments can be made to anyone, but the principal can only be claimed by the person to whom the bond is registered. Investors buy bonds for the interest income. Bond prices in the market change when market interest rates change. Bond prices may also change with the changing condition of the issuing company. If you buy a bond strictly for the income, then the current market price may be irrelevant. If you're a bond trader, then the current price is more of an issue. Bonds don't trade as frequently or as transparently as stock. You won't see online quotes for bonds other than government securities. And you're going to have to do your own research. You can buy treasury bonds through Treasury Direct. For corporate bonds, you'll need to go through a broker, full service discount online. Commissions vary, so you'll need to do research on those as well. There is online information about bonds. Some of the sites are listed and linked on this slide. Financial press coverage of bonds is there, but it's more limited. Where active stocks trade every few seconds, some corporate bonds may not trade for days, even weeks. Read that as illiquid. Treasury bonds are highly liquid, so current quotes for those are more readily available. Bonds are rated for quality and associated risk of default by several rating agencies. The most well-known are Moody's and S&P. Be aware that firms pay the rating agencies to rate their bonds. Better rating, lower interest rate they have to pay. Bond rating agencies have received a lot of bad press in recent years for not being as quick to recognize a problem in downgrading a bond. And bond ratings are well known to not be leading indicators of trouble with a firm. Exhibit 11A on page 371 in your text more fully describes the ratings used by the two largest agencies. The descriptions are fairly self-explanatory. Bonds rated BAA or BBB and above are considered investment grade. Below are considered junk or high yield. Bond ratings reflect only the potential for the company to default on the bond issue. When we look at stocks, we're concerned with growth. With bonds, investors want their interest payments on time and the face value back at maturity. This is the bottom part of Exhibit 11A covering 
CAA and triple C rated and below bonds. These are very high risk bonds, potentially close to or already in default. If you've had Finance 331, then you're already familiar with the terms yield and maturity and current yield. The yield and maturity at any time on a bond is the current market rate for bonds of similar risk and maturity. The bond is currently priced so that this is the yield an investor will earn if they buy the bond today and hold it to maturity. Current yield is quoted in financial periodicals. It is simply the annual coupon divided by the current price. Remember that bonds pay interest semi-annually, but current yield uses an annual coupon. This slide also lists some other sources for information on bonds with links. Here is a sample of quotes for Home Depot bonds. Looking at the first bond, it matures on December 16, 2036. The current price is quoted as a percent of par. Remember, corporate bonds are assumed to have a face value of $1,000, so 93.51% of par is $935.10. The annual coupon rate is 5.875, so the bond pays $58.75 annually, or half of that every six months. The current yield of maturity is 6.365. Note that this bond is paying a coupon rate lower than the yield of maturity. That's why it's selling below par. The current yield is equal to $58.75 divided by 935.10, or 6.283. That ends Chapter 11. These last slides recap our learning objectives why you should establish an investment program, how to consider safety, risk, return, income, growth, and liquidity in choosing investment vehicles, consider ways to reduce investment risk, continuing identify the factors that reduce risk, understand why investors purchase government bonds, and understand why investors purchase corporate bonds. Where to find information to evaluate bonds. The remaining slides are for auto readers.